Good morning, Jill Marini. Welcome on VH Berries. Nice to meet you. I'm very excited and good morning to you. I am very grateful. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm in California. I get no complaint. The weather, the, 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 the everything here is always beautiful. So I'm very happy. It's a great morning. Worked a lot this morning. So I'm, I'm, ready, um, I'm ready to spend time with you. I am very inspired by your work and uh, this new decade is definitely the beginning of a new area, uh, starting with your involvement in two major uh, historical uh, future film. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, yeah, I've done, uh, I'm luckily um, from where I started it to where I am now, there's quite a bit of, um, of things that uh, went through and I'm talking about TV shows and movies and, and, and documentary and reality shows. I've done quite a bit of things. So for that, I'm very proud of it. And hopefully it keeps going. And I would love to discuss about this very specific uh, movie, uh, Waiting for Anya. Can you tell us a little bit more about these very special experiences? Yeah, I mean, I got approached by um, a director, a young director called, uh, named Ben Cookson. He's an Englishman and uh, very smart, very sweet, um, and specifically very young for, for, the, for, for what he was um, endeavoring. And uh, it's really the story about, a true story about what happened in the southwest of France during the Second World War. Uh, the story involved um, youth uh, getting involved with being able to take young Jewish kids, disguise them as shepherd, and transfer them from France to Spain where the Nazi and the Gestapo and all that during the Second World War were not there yet. So from what I heard when I was there, there is 7,500 kids and people who were transferred from that region to Spain. So it's countless the, the, the human lives that uh, this region has saved, but yet no one has ever talked about it. So it's the first time there is a movie about it that um, that uh, usually we, we know the, the what's happening in Paris, what's happening in big cities, the deportation, this and this and that. But um, the shepherd from that region did what they had to do as men and women and saves all those kids, but never talked about it because it was just logical to do it and just move on with our lives. Um, I met directly the people that were involved with um, with the help that happened during that time in 1944 and three and four and five and seeing the families um being remembering all these stories and the people who lost their life and everything else was really uh, inspiring to me uh, i've did some couple of insane things because we started to film in april i believe and this is where the snow melts so myself and uh, <laughs> and and myself and thomas le marquis um that was also um, an actor on the film, we decided to go from France to Spain and retrace the exact path the people were taking those kids back to freedom in Spain. And we were hit by avalanches and it was insane. I don't know why we did that, but um, we did that. We, we wanted to feel exactly what those people felt, even though we can never feel it, but at least retracing the, the, the difficulty of, of that, uh, huge hike with with uh, uh, with my friend was really inspiring and got us ready to uh, to shoot a film that was very special to all of us and Jill Marini we can totally feel this extreme preparation yeah uh, that also includes to direct a flock or of sheep oh my god yeah yeah <laughs> you do the it's funny uh, unfortunately we lost our, our dog that we adore a couple months ago and now we are thinking about getting another dog and we talking, we're thinking about Australian Shepherd or uh, the dog that I met over there that were gathering all these cows and goats and sheep. You know, the human don't do much in that situation. They literally teach their dog how to do the work for them and gather those, those sheep. And there's a word, uh, um, to gather the sheep and they understand and it's called sigh, sigh. So whenever you go to that region, <laughs> you hear in the mountain, the mountain, sigh, sigh. And then it's, it's one of the most incredible experience I ever had as, as an actor. First of all, I lost 35 to 40 pounds for it. 
I needed to look very um, gone and skinny and specifically at the beginning of the movie. And then also I, it filled me up with, um, I have videos that I never posted yet, videos of me leaving in the morning alone and retracing those steps and go all the way to Spain. And during that time, the, the third time that I tried to go to Spain uh, through the village we were in France, I was followed by a herd of um, chamois, we call it. It's like a goat. <laughs> and there were like hundreds of them. And they were really interested about looking at what the hell am I doing here during that time of the year? There's no human at that time of the year. So I was alone taking enormous risks while filming. So that's not a good thing. I won't do that again. And <laughs> I literally <laughs> thought that was the uh, most amazing things I've done on my, on my own. And one of those days I, uh, when I go to, um, to Canada, to Montreal, I will definitely uh, show you some of the videos that I'm definitely not allowed to show because it takes so much. I took so much risks, but um, it was very inspiring, man. I, I, I recommend the world to, uh, to feel what I felt that day because it was very special. In this feature film called uh, Waiting for Anya, uh, we can see some obviously uh, ships, but also uh, horses, donkeys, and even a beer. <laughs> I had a fantastic time with a donkey. Okay, hold up. I had a great time <laughs> spending afternoon with a donkey. He was so gentle and he always comes around me because I'm a sucker. I kept giving it, I kept cutting the grass for him. Oh, he was amazing. But we had a donkey, we have horses, we have incredible old cars. We had, um, we recreated a lot of uh, bars and And, and places there back in the days where, where, where the French community were, was not allowed to really uh, do what they used to because they were invaded. But um, the underground life of the French people is always very strong. They don't, uh, they don't give up that easily, even if they don't make too much noise about it. They're just really strong people. So I was really amazed by the reconstructions of the sets of the, um, we, we hired, I mean, the production hired countless of reenactment people. And they were so involved with reenactments. I thought many times that I was in 1944. That was amazing. And I think that we all understood with your pronunciation of the word chamois that you are also <laughs> French and that this story is very close to your heart. Oh no, for sure. I am French. I was born in France. I'm always going to be French. Uh, since 2012, I'm now dual citizenships. I'm also American. And I'm very proud of that because my American side is the side of um, uh, get up and do it. It's going to be tough for anybody to understand what I meant here, but um, I had a lot of issues in my mind about how the French uh, um, government was seeing people who wanted to work. They were not giving them enough respect and, and funds and, 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 and pay. Uh, yet I arrived here and I used my two hands and two feet and I was starting to make... Uh, substantial amount of money. And I'm talking about, I used to make $150 a month as a firefighter when I was in the service in Paris. I go from that to make $150 a day as a waiter for me was gigantic. So I've, um, I've those two, uh, I'm dual citizen. I'm a dual citizen, uh, French and American. And I have love for both country very differently. One is more my heart and where my soul where I was born and the other one is more like my adult life where everything really started for me and embellished. So I love and respect both nations with everything I have. This is very inspiring, uh, Jill Marini, and I would love to retrace uh, this journey, uh, as you mentioned, starting from being a firefighter. Ah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I did start at six years old to be a baker. My father was a, a baker. <laughs> so I was literally born in a bakery. My mom started the job <laughs> Uh, in a small little village called saint Valier, then transferred me to Caen because, of course, you can't really have a kid in a bakery. It's kind of weird and difficult, and women are so strong, I don't know how they do this. But um, she uh, uh, raised me in the bakery with my father, and um, that's all I knew. Really, truly, that's all I knew. I remember six years old, falling asleep, making tarte aux fraises, and I know you understand what I mean. 
strawberry uh, uh, shortcake, <laughs> strawberry tart. I was, I was, I was, um, I was really good at this. You know, I was, I was so in love being around my father. Um, my dad was the epicenter of of who I, I was going to become. And I felt it all with everything I had when I was really young. So I decided to literally concentrate more on, on, on the baking side of things and, and be surrounded by my dad. And there is a God somewhere because when I turned 18, you know, he died. So uh, for me, uh, the, everything started uh, through the uh, mindset and the dedication that my dad gave to us, to me uh, particularly, because I was the one working a lot with him in the bakery. And uh, that forged me to become kind of a, a no-nonsense, it's time to work for 15 hours a day, it's all good, right? So that, he gave me a lot of that. So I always gonna be uh, very thankful for my father. So he started in the bakery, and then at 18 years old, close to be 18 years old, he wanted me to see something else than baking. So we looked into the hardest, uh, one, one of the hardest um, army section in France, and the firefighters from Paris were extremely difficult to get in. Literally, out of 800 people, only two people from the South were accepted, I guess. And I was one of them, so he was really proud. And when I went to the army, I became a firefighter there. Um, complete different type of career and job. Um, I absolutely loved it because I didn't know that, you, you know, you, you think as a firefighter, you go and save people. That's pretty rare when that happened. And it's really amazing for yourself. But at the same time, uh, uh, that taught me a lot of things for the aftermath of being a firefighter and I had the opportunity to help other people in very moments of distress where your life is at stakes and, and having that knowledge to me, um, I again owe that to my father for pushing me to go do that. And by him sending me to the army, uh, he, that's the moment he got sick. So when I came back from uh, the military service, um, when I came back from the military service, he, he, he passed away at that time. So yeah, my father is the epicenter of all my life and he always will be. Your father was the epicenter of your life and both the uh, baker and firefighter job uh, are very tough jobs in terms of uh, schedule and effort. And if I understood correctly, uh, while uh, being a firefighter, uh, they are always, for example, doing um, calendar annually <laughs> with pictures. And you got uh, noticed by a photographer and then uh, it led you to start a modeling career. Exactly. You're hundred percent. I just had a text with, <laughs> I just texted Fred Goudon. You're talking about Frederick Goudon, G-O-U-D-O-N, right? Goudon. I know you're French. You understand what I'm saying. So usually I have to, you see what I mean? See what I'm doing here when, when I have interviews or a uh, podcast or, or anything with an American audience, I have to really spell things usually because my accent would go to a certain place that you understand. So today I don't have to do it. I'm very happy. So Fred Goudon is an incredible photographer. We met, I was 18 years old and in Paris and he, uh, took pictures of me and said, this is what you need to do. Your classical look, you're going to last long in this business. And then we became so close. I mean, it is my family. I don't know what else to say. He texted me long, not, not long ago. I said, I love you. I say, I love you, my brother, dot, dot, dot. And it's been forever and forever. <laughs> and he's like, uh, he he m'a dit, c'est réciproque. I can't wait to see you. I'm going to see him next May. So I'm very excited. This is a man that put me in the business, period. And Jill Marini, after that dot, 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 it led you to take a one-way trip to America. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about the very special uh, early days? Yeah. You just told me that you were, for example, a waiter. Yes. So what I did is I dropped everything that I thought um, I knew. Um, I had a 500 bucks in my pocket. I took a flight, kind of a duffel bag and hoping for the best, right? Uh, when I got there, I did um, 
what other people do when they come here. You know, they try to find a new life and opportunities and everything else. So I did the thing the right way, I believe. Um, I worked really hard. I pro I proved everyone that I was not only um, at that time, because this is gone long ago, a pretty face. And when it comes down to modeling, I took uh, Marco Di Consilis was uh, is still a, a, a very pr prominent model. And we met in Miami and he told me one thing one time. He says, M modeling, treat it as a real job. Not as we 20 something years old, we get to Miami, we did a couple photo shoots, you get a couple grand, life is good, let's spend on alcohol and drinks and whatever the hell you go and do that and when you're 20. He said, take that as a real career. It's important. It's not just modeling. And I, I listened to what he said. I was very uh, intrigued and I applied it. So when I was able to do some modeling, I really thrive. And the moment uh, where I had the opportunity to be on front of a camera, that was more like a recording versus like, you know, just modeling, pausing on, on for prints, um, the camera really showed that loved me. It was more this, this attraction, this, this charisma that was happen, happening with a, with a, with a camera. So um, I went from Miami of being a waiter, having a young child, having a dog and wife, having, having like this family where you should starting to be okay, no matter what I do now, I need to settle, to, um, to work really good as a model and to decide one day, um, out, of, out of a Will Smith story, so I don't know if you want to hear this one right now, but to move to Los Angeles, but Miami for three or four years, back and forth with France. I really learned the ropes. Um, it was the time of, you know, 9-11. So there was some times where I had to go back to Europe and stay over there, work for Giorgio Armani as a model. I did a lot of little things that really opened up of um, who I am in the business and understanding the ropes and how things go. Yeah, it was interesting. It was, um, Miami for me was um, an absolute amazing time. I will always, see Miami as my first, uh, my first place in America. Absolutely, Jill Mariani, because in addition of taking modeling as a real job, I would also add that you are seeing this as a real sport. Uh, what do you mean real sport? With this competition oh. aspect with yourself. No, absolutely. Everything I do, uh, uh, it's all, of course you compete with yourself. No matter what people think, uh, no matter what people do, you're gonna always have like a little bit of issue with yourself for saying, did I do enough? Did, can I do it again? You know, um, I have that problem enormously. Um, sometimes it's paralyzing. You, you uh, I, I think more than ego, it's, um, it's how I came up to this um, art form. You know, there was no method of teaching, no family to take you to classes. I'm really like, I'm a, I'm a million miles away from, from my career. It's not something I should have been able to even uh, be able to do it. You know, it's really a story of, of defying the odds. No matter what uh, you look, no matter what you are, or no matter what the color of your skin, or your stupid accent that I've been hearing for the last 20 years that I'm here, 25 years that I'm here. Uh, it's, <laughs> oh, I swear to God, you have hurdles more than you can ever imagine, you know? So it really, it's really up to you to, um, to, to, uh, to keep grinding. And, and, and for that, you gotta be careful because the more you're in the demand, the better it is. The more you want to be in demand, the less you are. So it's very uh, a complex, very thin line that you have to play with when you're in the industry. But um, I think it's, um, it's worth it at the end of the day, because if you're passionate with what you do, that is what you need to do. Jill Marini, you just mentioned the fact that going against the odd also means to improve and to learn English as uh, at your very start. Yeah, I have no English at all. I mean, if my English teacher hear me today, they will just like, they will be baffled. <laughs> I believe when I came here, I knew, I knew my name is, and unfortunately for me, <laughs> unfortunately for me was, my name is Gilles. And when you say my name here, they react to, 
Well, what do you mean? How do you spell it? For me, how you spell it means nothing except like it's shocking and their face of shock was making me a little bit like, mm, hold on a second, what did I say wrong? I just said my name. So the worst is when you spell it to uh, uh, anyone from an Anglo-Saxon dialect. G-I-L-L-E-S means a thousand things. Giles, Giles, Gilles, uh, you, you name it. <laughs> you name it. My name is being so butchered that I accept any kind of way people do or say. Any kind of ways. I gave up 24 years ago. <laughs> In definitive, Jill Marini, giving your name was a sort of deadly game. Nah, yeah, exactly. Every time I gave my name away, it was like, okay, fight's happening. We uh, we're gonna have to explain uh, the entire uh, background of the where the name comes from and how to spell it. Also, that French people like to make things complicated, so you make everybody laugh and you move on. Hey, if my name was John, it was so much better. For sure. And I just mentioned the two words, deadly games, uh, because this is going to be your uh, upcoming release. Uh, this is a story that tells, um, that follows four uh, influencers who are uh, invited on an Iceland. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting because the, the people who actually taking the temperature now in this world, uh, we cannot ignore it anymore, are influencers. They are the, they are the new network of the, the world. You know, this, if a uh, Jake Paul uh, say something, it's on the news, no matter what it is, that is a, a jackass or a good person or a bad person. If you become an influencer, you're gonna have a voice and an important one. I know the networks and, 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 and all these executives are trying to tame this down as much as possible, but it's really not possible anymore. Influencers have no idea how much, um, you know, much more money that actually they could make. Uh, it's, it's beautiful to see like you can be anyone that used to be completely ignored by um, this entity of Hollywood to being able to do whatever they want and not having to need them or wait for any phone calls. They're just creating and they make things happen. So what's happening in the movie industry, they're starting to say, oh no, we got to start giving them love. So we are, um, we shot a film about influencers, about truly it's called Daily, Daily Games, but it was actually called OnlyFans. And it was because of many of the stories of, of having f crazy fans finding out those influencers and either attacking them, killing them. I mean, it was it, worldwide, there's a lot of stories of young influencers getting in type of, some type of trouble. So that's what the movie is about. It's about this woman who wants to give a, 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 an enormous amount of money to those influencers uh, as a competition, but it turns out to be a deadly one. That's what it is. Your character is named uh, Christian Estrella, and you actually uh, did the recording and shooting in Cancun, Mexico. Yeah, terrible place to be. I cannot believe I went to this down there Mexico thing that I adore. It was amazing. I want to shoot every movie in exotic location for the rest of my life, and I'm okay with not getting paid the way I used to, and that's good enough. I'm telling you. Um, Cancun, I know there's some edgy part of it. I know there's this and this and that. I haven't seen it. I walked everywhere in Cancun at whatever time of the night and the day. I'm not going out there with like a hundred dollar bill say, please attack me or watches and this and that. I have to <laughs> understand that I need to respect, I need to respect the community and the things that we have at home. Uh, eventually they would love to have it and sometimes it creates violence and, and, and this and that, but I absolutely adore being over there. It was amazing. The people we were working with were so appreciative to actually be doing something with an American production. And, and it was no, um, anyone was, nobody was mean. We, we met people that were really from the bush, you know, very, very primitive in a sense. And I all respect that, by the way, because I love being off grid and I love being very primitive, but that's the way they live. I have a choice. And I, we met those people that were intrigued by what we were doing. We met people that wanted to learn. I mean, people who never had a, 
internet. I know it's, it's fresh and it's possible, but people who haven't seen technology yet and meeting and, and conversing and being with those, in the same like of these, these people really made me understand that if the world shuts down today for real, they're fine. We're not. We like what's gonna happen? I can send an email no more. I cannot work anymore. I cannot. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot see what the weather. Last week I went to my cabin home. A little segue, and there was no reception. And I hasn't. I have. I didn't know it was going to be that way. It was completely a gridlock, and I didn't ever record a song on my phone. So when we wanted to have a little music, we had five songs to play in, on the in a loop. And I realized that if you lose the internet, your life is not the same anymore. And the control that this world of the internet is now, it's pretty scary because our thought at every moment is nobody can reach us. We are cut from the world. And that was really odd. So that made me think about, we're gonna have to uh, have quite a bit of backup. And that was a little segue of me, I always do that, sorry, brother. <laughs> Jill Marini, I can totally feel how obsessed you are with Cancun, Mexico. I love and it. To come back to uh, the production side, uh, when I told you that you were uh, taking um, this uh, mission as a competition with yourself and after the success of uh, Sex and the City, for example, it led you um, to uh, focus more and this is going to be the case uh, in the decades to come into distribution, distribution and production. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, the, the lesson learned during the pandemic for me was um, the switch off can be extremely fast and brutal. You lose your well-being, you lose everything you ever worked for, you go back to not only zero but minus five, uh, if you lose everything and you can just go across the street and get another job, it's one thing. But when you're in this world of acting and all that shit, uh, you are under the microscope a lot more. So people are judging easy, easily. They're judging, they're pointing fingers and they're laughing. You know, it makes people happy when there is something dramatic, right? So I've seen countless of friends of mine and it affected me too. I gotta be honest about this pandemic and the shutdown of everything, the, uh, the, the social uh, distort that is happening right now, the separation and everything. So you put a lot of people in, into very uh, big trouble. So I realized that I need to keep my feet moving in a lot more different aspect of the game. So I started to uh, put down words on papers, creating um, uh, specs and, and, and TV shows, writing down movies and synopsis and Right now I'm working uh, uh, on the synopsis uh, in a movie that uh, hopefully will be shot in Kenya. It's a, it's a region of the world that I always wanted to explore and, and, and bring light to a place where us uh, Westerners need to learn really their ways more than learning our ways and thinking that we have all the science in the world. I think sometimes when you go back to places where people are, are more in tune with themselves because it's a survival thing, um, there's a lot to learn from them. So I'd love to shoot a film over there and that's what I'm working on right now. I'm going to Cannes, where I was born, to um, I involve myself with, uh, with the people that, uh, where we shot Deadly, Deadly, Deadliest Game, Deadly Games, and uh, we are going to uh, try to sell the movies in Cannes, so voila. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry, my gardener is uh, moving all this beautiful pollen and I'm getting it in my face. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, Jill Marini, you just mentioned the fact that uh, the lockdown and what happened in 2020 uh, was a huge material for uh, inner reflection. Um, and that maybe you got some uh, struggle, for example, um, with keeping up uh, physically because you have a very athletic uh, um, body and way of living life. Yeah, I'm, I'm alway, I always moved around. I mean, nothing to do with anything professional in a way, but close to. I always wanted to be... Um, to be in shape and, and, um, and, 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 you know, you gotta lead by example. You know, if, you, if you're in this limelight, 
you have responsibilities. You don't get up and slap someone in the face. You, you know, you don't do none of this shit. So you, you have to be, you have to be you as much as you can, but you have to uh, add up a lot of uh, effort to not be just the one you are at home. And at home, you have to be also that person. So being in this industry also makes you, you have to be really better than what other people can actually be. You know, if, so, if, if my neighbor next door has uh, ideologically speaking position that are definitely not mine because they're either racist or whatnot, uh, he can say it, he can be himself. Um, us, we have a responsibility to make this world go around and have people understanding that uh, being one and respectful and and all that is is crucial, you know. So we start with our kids, but for me, because of my job, I have to to share uh, uh, whatever knowledge I have and make sure that everybody else around get better. And in the world of division, it's really complicated the last couple of years because no matter what you say, it's going to be more than fifty percent of the population who locked in into a certain way to think, and they don't want to budge. That's um, that's also what I learned a lot this, um, during this time of pandemic. But um, the responsibility that actors have is pretty intense and it's not really fair at times sometimes, but you know, that's just the way it is. And this responsibility, Jill Marini, will also be applied on your upcoming uh, movie in Kenya. Can you tell us a little bit more about the mission of this uh, particular feature film? Yeah. So, I mean, this is really an, a, a rough go. This is the beginning of everything. I contacted the people over there in Kenya to, to see what they think about uh, the idea about the films and... And then we're getting to uh, talk about writing the script fully. And then, of course, <laughs> it, of course, it will be a, a production, pre-production and everything else. I, I just want to show the splendor of this nation, but also their techniques and their ways of... It's really a medical slash love story uh, through a lot of hurdles that uh, two human beings, these two main characters, but it's uh, about six total that are really important in the film. But I would say that um, it's, a, it's about unlearning what you know, letting go, and opening your mind and eyes to a different horizon. And through things that we always, as Westerners, looking at like, ah, that's just a third world country or, or this and that, you know? So it's very important for me to explore as much as I can the, um, the beauty of, of that nation in a place where I have never been before, but studied so much that I can't wait for it to happen. And Jill Marini, unfortunately, you won't be able to bring your favorite uh, flock of sheep there. <laughs> no, they be eaten <laughs> right away. <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, it's funny, uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, you'd be surprised. In Kenya, they have mountain with snow. It's It's a really incredible uh, uh, culture, and I'm pretty sure they have a lot of cattle and herds and all that. I would not be able to bring mine, but I'm sure they have theirs, and I would be maybe able to help them out and learn the new the dialect of how they herd them around. That's to me, it's important. I, I love that culture side of things. I am looking forward to see those uh, wild uh, landscape shot as in uh, burning oh, wow. at both ends and waiting for Anya. Jill Marini, thank you so much. Are you kidding me? Thanks to you. And I know I'm going to see you in July because I'm coming to Montreal. So um, I, I, will, um, I will bug you so we can have a little lunch or dinner and um, you can meet all my friends from the industry and just do more of that. 